I'm happy because I've shared football pitches and shots, and indeed much of my life with players like Tostao, Garincha, Coldado, Pepe, Rivellino, Gilmar, Bellini, Jarzinho, Zagallo, and so many others. I've lived through football's golden years. The Brazil teams of 1958, 62, and 70 brought football to the world, made people fall in love with it. Our joyful way of playing gave the rest of the world a taste for this marvellous sport. In that time, we spread a real passion for football, a passion that seems to be passed on in the genes, as children are born with a love for this game already in their hearts. And this is an excerpt from the book we're going to talk about today, The Autobiography by Edson Arantes de Nascimento, more likely known to you, dear listener, as the legendary Pele. Welcome to Performers, the podcast that takes you inside the minds of the world's most extraordinary athletes, coaches, and performers. We're your hosts. I'm Dr. Duncan Simpson, and you've just heard from Dr. Greg Young, and the sports psychology experts will guide you through the pages of their autobiographies, revealing the mindsets, strategies, and habits that propel the world's best to the pinnacle of their fields. So, Greg, why this book today? Well, a list of Pele's accomplishments and records, it's, it's unbelievable, and it goes on for pages and pages, but here are some of the key highlights. Right, strap in. Guinness World Record for most career goals in world football, including friendlies, 1,283 in 1,363 games, which is a crazy return. Only player to win three FIFA World Cups in 1958, 1962, and 1970. The youngest winner of a FIFA World Cup, aged 17 years and 249 days, in that first one in 1958. The youngest goal scorer in a FIFA World Cup with the same age, for Brazil versus Wales in 1958. 77 goals for Brazil in just 92 games. Seven Ballon d'Ors, which is basically the world's best player, in 1958, 59, 60, 61, 63, 64, and 1970. Football Player of the Century, elected by France Football's Ballon d'Or winners in 1999. Time Magazine's one of the 100 most important people of the 20th century in 1999. Athlete of the Century, elected by the International Olympic Committee, also in 1999 and FIFA Player of the Century in 2000. I think we can safely say he's widely regarded as the greatest ever to play the game, perhaps until Lionel Messi came along. And even now, Pelé is so revered in soccer circles that his name and status is akin to Michael Jordan in basketball, Wayne Gretzky in hockey, Michael Phelps in swimming, and Serena Williams in tennis. That's unbelievable. Unbelievable. So let's dive in. Football is special. You play in a group. You can't play it alone. There is something magical in the absolute harmony that exists among teammates. A ball passed well to a striker is every bit as important as the goal itself. When it's well-tuned, it all comes out beautifully, as though we were taking part in a cleverly choreographed dance. The ambition should always be to play an elegant game, because from that nucleus emerges an example that reaches everyone. In Brazil and beyond, this is what counts. We have to be worthy and competent to show the world that we're not just five-time champions, but also people with feelings and manners, obeying the number one rule of every sport and of life to know how to lose. Yeah, Greg, from this opening paragraph, it really feels like there's a spiritual connection that Pele has to the game. And I think it's really somewhat similar to what we heard from the people of New Zealand, how much they revere the All Black side. There is that cultural and spiritual connection to the sport that just goes beyond simply soccer or rugby. And I think we'll see how important that connection is as we progress here. So let's learn a little bit about the beginning of the man. Pele was born and grew up in Tres Corajones, which means three hearts in Brazilian. I was poor, in a small house built from second-hand bricks. But although this makes it sound sturdy, from the outside, you could tell how ramshackle it was. Although I'm honoured that the street has been named after me, and there's even a plaque on the house saying that's where I was born. It hasn't changed much, and it still looks pretty run down. Perhaps the plaque even holds the thing together. My dad, João Ramos de Nascimento, everyone knows him as Don Dino. He was from a small town about 60 miles away. He was doing military service in Tres Corajones when they met. He was also a centre forward for Atletico de Tres Corajones. It wasn't a properly professional club, and it hardly made him any money. In those days, being a footballer meant you had a kind of reputation. It gave you 
how shall I say, a certain notoriety. Anyway, my parents married when she was 15, and by 16, she was pregnant with me. Life wasn't easy, and soon there were more mouths to feed. My brother Jair, known as Zoka, was born in the same house I was. I'm sure my mother was thinking, I hope neither of my sons decide to become a footballer. There's no money in it. A doctor, perhaps? Now there's a sensible job. Well, we know what happened. I would grow to love the game as my father did. It was the thing he knew best, and he hoped, like tens of thousands of other footballers in Brazil, that one day he would get the break that meant he could finally support us through scoring goals. It almost happened. In 1942, he was called up to play for Atletico Mineiro, the biggest club in the state. It seemed that this was the stroke of luck he needed. This was a proper professional club that was known nationally. My father received an invitation from a football club in Baru, northwest of Sao Paulo, to play there, but also, crucially, to take on a job as a local government functionary. My mother was delighted at this prospect of a non-football job, which would bring the family some security and improve our financial circumstances. We would finally, she hoped, be able to escape from the suffocation of near destitution. Things looked different to children, though. We knew nothing. Life just carried on as normal. So it sounds like with a few of our other performers that he has a real connection to his dad and, and having his dad as a footballer, I think there's going to be a thread here whereby he's really looking to mimic his dad and move into that field. So they moved to Baru, uh, but the normal non-footballing job offer fell through when the club was taken over. Although the footballing offer remained, but of course being an athlete isn't easy as the family found out. During the periods when my dad was sidelined from football through injury, the family really struggled. Zoka, Maria Lucia and I were always barefoot and wore only cast-off clothes. The house was small and overcrowded with a leaky roof. With no regular source of income, I remember that on several occasions the only meal my mum had for us was bread with a slice of banana. We never went without food, like many people worse off than us in Brazil. But for my mother, it was a life governed by fear. A fear of not being able to provide. And one of the things I've learned in my 65 years is that fear of life is fear of the worst kind. About a year later, things picked up at home when my father finally managed to land a job working in a health clinic. It was pretty menial stuff, cleaning, fetching and carrying mostly. But because the job was funded by the local government, it felt much more secure than any of the other part-time work he did. And for the first time in years, the shadow of poverty was lifted, not removed, but at least lifted from our house. Duncan, we often hear of athletes having to struggle on the road to success. And of course, this really has nothing to do with Pele's football career yet. But does something like this help or hurt a young athlete that's aspiring for greatness? I think early life struggles can help build resilience and determination, Greg. Going through hard things can serve as powerful lessons, not just in itself, but we have to reflect on them properly and learn the lessons from those things. Additionally, growing up in challenging conditions, I, I think can instill that sense of gratitude when we have success and when opportunities come our way. And lastly, I think growing up in poverty or going through early challenges may aid that motivation to succeed, may kind of instill that desire to lift oneself out of poverty. And that could be a powerful motivator, as we saw with Mike Tyson. However, I, I don't want to glorify poverty and, and struggle, I think, which is obviously inherently a negative thing. And I think on the flip side, when, you, when you're coming through that difficult circumstance, it can create immense pressure to succeed. I think for every successful athlete that we've seen come out of poverty, there's undoubtedly thousands that don't and buckle under those pressures. And lastly, I think the other dark side of poverty, as I'd call it, would be the limited resources and access to things like facilities, equipment, and coaching. So yes, I think on one hand, it can help build resilience, but I definitely don't want to glorify some of the challenges and and poverty in in itself. And I think Pele is aware of some of these challenges and really wants to contribute to the household. So he tries to make some money as a shoe shine and that doesn't necessarily work <laughs> for him. Um, so he ends up heading off, to, heading off to school. And he says, as I grew up, Baru became my city. There was family, there was school, there was football. More on that later. But there was also play. I made friends with a lot of the kids in the neighborhood around my house, black, white, even some Japanese kids. All I wanted to do was play. My friends would come to the yard and we'd invent games, even putting on mini circuses. The branches of the trees were our trapeze and the risks we took were terrifying. My mother and grandmother didn't like these games one bit. I longed for space and the yard was too small. I moved out onto the street. Happy is the child who can play out on the street. 
but then the street outside our house wasn't enough, so I began to venture further. Looking back, there's a kind of innocence to the games we played then, even though we sometimes got in trouble for them. Nowadays, there aren't many children who can play on the street. Duncan Dan Carter talked a lot about the ability to play and explore and socialise within the community and with people of his own age. What's your take on the current state of youth sports, given the move away from sort of the play model and self-exploration to perhaps a more organised model of almost professionalisation? Why don't you throw me a grenade and see where <laughs> yeah. we start? Uh, wow. I, I think the question might be, you know, when you think about play, how does it actually benefit development? And we know from kind of the research and the literature that unstructured and semi-structured play, you know, can enhance children in terms of developing, you know, curiosity and creativity. It enhances that ability to experiment and be independent decision makers, as well as developing social skills because you're just with your peers and you're figuring out rules to the games and, you know, figuring out how to get over arguments and things like that. Therefore, undoubtedly play is incredibly important, I think, in development. And and I don't think it's just sport. I think play can be instrumental in other performance domains. I think we can think about those benefits that I just listed and they can apply probably to music and acting and art, whereby it's not just formal and structured. As performers improve their ability, and, and I think as you go through the age levels, Greg, I think you'll see some elements of play replaced by maybe more formalized coaching or, you know, where we really focus on developing specific techniques. But I, I actually strongly believe that even at the professional level of sport and high performance domains, that individuals should ha still have the opportunity to be playful and creative and express themselves and have fun. And I think, unfortunately, you know, usually it's the adults that ruin such opportunities for children by pressing them to be more professional and get it more structured and, and make it look like, oh, this is what performance looks like. But I know we're talking about Brazil here, but I think that professionalization of youth sports is a very US-centric thing in particular. But I want to recognize that we have listeners around the world. So this concept of professionalization of youth sport might be actually kind of alien to you because that doesn't happen in certain countries. When it actually comes to that professionalization of youth sport, I think the reality is in the US, it really is big business now. So therefore, I think it's important for us to consider what do best practices look like within that structure. For example, like really good qualified coaching done in a safe environment is marvelous. And it's not necessarily a replacement for play in itself. And I try not to get on my soapbox, but I think when we have really young athletes, you know, I'm, I'm talking 10 and under when they're doing really specialized strength and conditioning work and specific sport training, if it's just working on pitching or just one element of the sport itself, that's where I think we can go a little bit too far. I don't even get me started on travel teams. If you live in a big city, you don't need to travel anywhere. You should be able to find competition. And I think those things are kind of more money-making exercise for adults. So to, to wrap it up, Greg, I think if we put the child their physical and mental well-being at the center of the decisions we make and what's most important for them, I don't think we're going to go far wrong. I did throw you a grenade and you've handled it really, really well. To be perfectly honest, I think I'm going to try and throw you a few more in this episode and see if you can handle it as well as that. I'm ready for them. So, of course, when you give a child space to find their passion, they often do so. Pele says, I suppose having a football as a father was the start of it. Most sons want to be like their fathers and I was no exception. Dondinho scored a lot of goals and everyone said he was good. I never thought of playing for Brazil or of winning the World Cup or anything like that. I just told my friends, one day I'm going to be as good as my dad. And Dondinho was a good man too. A marvellous father. And despite the fact that his football never brought in much money, because it was the game that he played, I guess I became fascinated by it too. It was in the genes. And this was Brazil, remember? Football was everywhere when I was growing up. As I played with friends in the yard or in the street, there were always games going on around us, usually organized by slightly bigger boys. My friends and I were desperate to take part, but it wasn't easy to get a place in their teams. They said I was too skinny. It's true, I was small and scrawny as a boy. Those were the first times I was barred from a game. And if anything, it only made me want it more. The boys we saw wanted to join were maybe 10, a few years older than us, and they thought they were the kings of the road. That didn't stop us, the young ones, from planning our own revolution. We'd hang around outside the pitch, and when the ball came out, we wouldn't return it, but we'd start playing with it ourselves. It earned us many slaps and kicks up the backside. My brother Zucker and I wouldn't hang around, though. We were afraid that our mother, 
Donna Celeste, made sure. Wow, there's a lot there. Something that, that cropped into mind is the quote from Francis Ford Coppola, the great director. He uses this maxim that the story of the son is embedded in the father. In other words, if you want to understand the boy, look at his father and his successes and failures. So I think there's something about the young boy growing up, looking upwards, looking at the dad and saying, hey, I, I just want to be that guy. This is really his first exploration into the game, Dunk. It's unstructured, it's unsupervised, it's pretty uncomplicated. I mentioned a little bit before, but play is about that creativity. It's about innovation, it's about skill development. You can hear the passion, the love for the game. And, and also, like he's playing against all the boys, he's developing some resilience and perseverance. And, and ultimately, you know, through that process, play is going to develop autonomy and decision making. There's just so much to unpack, but the importance of play cannot be understated here. Because of the unstructured and uncomplicated nature, he goes on to say, we had no kit, of course, not even a ball. And we had to make do with stuffing paper or rags into a sock or a stocking, shaping it as best we could into a sphere and then tying it with string. Every now and then we'd come across a new sock or a bit of clothing sometimes. It must be said from an unattended clothesline, the ball would get a little bit bigger and we'd tie it again. Eventually it came to resemble something close to a proper football. My first matches were held in the prestigious Rubens Aruda Street Stadium. Goal posts of old shoes at either end, one where the street finished in a cul-de-sac and the other where it crossed into the Sete de Setembro Street, named after Brazil's Independence Day. The touchlines more or less where the houses began on either side. But for me at the time, it was like the Maracanã and the place where I began to develop my skills, as well as the chance to spend time with my friends and test myself against them. This was when I first learned the joy of controlling the ball, making it go the way I wanted to, at the speed I wanted to. Not always easy with a ball made of socks. Playing football soon became more than just a pastime. It became an obsession. Now, listeners, if you are on Apple or Spotify, I want you to pause. I want you to go over to YouTube and I want you to watch Greg. Greg is now wearing a Brazilian shirt and he's speaking perfect Portuguese. I can't believe it. Unbelievable. You could be Brazilian. I think that was one of the countries I tried to run for president for, so I had to brush up on that and get my costume and, and, and attire sorted. My first rule in office would be to give everyone a football. They wouldn't have to play with bags of old socks and stockings. The last word, or one of the last words he says, is obsession. And it's certainly a term that we've heard from some of our performers. I think in particular, obsession was used over and over by Pat Summit and Kobe Bryant and Chrissy Wellington, how they absolutely obsessed over their performance domains. And we hear it here from Pele. So they decided to try and create a club and formalize the team, basically the group of people that they had playing on the street. So they had talent, but not a lot else. So they needed money to get kit and equipment. But of course, this is no easy task. So they just focused on playing games. Our team would put on our vests and shorts in my yard and we'd file out, just like proper teams in a proper stadium. Dreaming children, always imitate the behavior of their idols. Dong and I absolutely love that last sentence. Dreaming children always imitate the behavior of their idols. What lessons can we take from that? You mean learn lessons from those that came before you? If only Greg, there was a podcast that could help people learn lessons from the very best performers of all time. I see what you've done there. Through their own sweat equity and a couple of schemes like trying to collect scrap metal and selling it, they formed the club Sete de Setembro, named after the street, which again was named after the Brazilian Day of Independence. He says, the forming of Sete de Setembro was a rite of passage in my life. In hindsight, I can see that it was important that we had to struggle to get the club founded. And I think my father admired our tenacity in pulling it all together. Having Don Dino as my first coach, maybe give me the edge with my peer group. There was lots of good kids around, but generally when choosing teams among ourselves, I was always chosen first. For someone so tiny, I was pretty strong, could jump high and was fearless, which meant that like my father, I scored lots of goals with my head. As a group of young players, they're trying to formulate a club. They're trying to live out their dream. And I think we're seeing that again, that theme of persistence. It's not easy. Absolutely. He says, Dondino taught me a lot, not just about technique, but about how to conduct myself on a football pitch. Some of the tricks and skills that would later help me score so many goals and win medals were established under his watchful eye. Duncan, this just sounds like watching you play football. <laughs> yeah, right. Luckily, we won't put any clips on YouTube of me playing football. 
Uh, if we can find some, we will definitely put them in the show notes, but I know it's pretty scarce. But seriously, we, you know, we see a performer with access to coaching and indeed again from a member of their family. Other than our last episode with Chrissy Wellington and perhaps Mike Tyson, I can't really think of another performer that we've spoken about that hasn't been hugely impact by, impacted by the contribution of their family, not only in the traditional family sense, but also in the development of their sport performance. Yeah, you're right. And I think there's a you know, well-used maxim in high performance that nobody does it alone. I'll say that again, nobody does it alone. So whether your support person is a, a parent, an uncle, a distant cousin, a sibling, or you find that coach, I think the important thing is that idea of support. Support can come in so many different forms, but nobody reaches the absolute pinnacle without some form of support. Where it comes from, I'm not sure that it really matters. Yes, we've seen parents be heavily involved up to this point. I don't know that it matters. Obviously, Mike Tyson had customado and, and found his coach. Chrissy Wellington found coaches along the way. So I'm not sure it matters who that person is, but everybody has a person at least in their corner. And I think Pele had more than one person. You know, that's the beauty of a team sport. He goes on to say it was a great education, supplemented by the hours of practice and experience gained with Seti de Septembro. And I loved spending that time with my father, learning football and how to be a man. My father always gave me wise advice. He told me that in football, there'll always be people who swear at you and other people who applaud. And that's just something we have to live with. He said that the best response to those who boo is to score a goal against their team. My father should have been luckier at football. He was really good. His explanation was simple and one he repeated often. It's not just enough to know how to play, you also have to follow the right path. And you need luck. Duncan, huge word at the end there. What role does luck play in the development of performers? Another doozy of a question, Greg, from you. The thing that comes to mind, and I've used this quote before, Steve Jobs says, you can only connect the dots looking backwards. And I truly believe that there's moments that change the course of people's lives, whether you call that sliding doors moments or whatever you want to call it. In a sporting context, it might be an injury to yourself or it might be an injury to someone who plays in your position so then you get an opportunity or it could be a change of coach or someone moves into the area or it could be a chance meeting you meet with an executive you might not know it at the time but as we look back on these moments we kind of stitch together and create our story we often create a narrative that suits our our mental framework of how life has worked out for us or or how how life didn't work out for us you know there's so many Guys sat in the pub saying, I should have been a Premier League soccer player and I was so unlucky. And I think we do create a narrative around our life. So luck per se, you know, for me, it's it's not really a concept I've truly ever wrapped my head around or spent you know, a ton of time thinking about. So I don't really have a strong point of view. But I don't think we've heard a story yet that's this linear path to success from start to finish. There's always bumps in the road. There's always going to be challenges. And I think it's how do you how do you handle those challenges and how do you take advantage of opportunities when they do come your way? I think that's really nicely summed up. And, and to build on that, you mentioned opportunity there, and I've heard it sort of described. Luck is preparation meets opportunity, and I think that's a you know being being in certain positions. And we've talked a lot about sliding doors moments in all of the episodes we've done so far with all of our different performers. It's probably true to say that you've got to be ready to meet that opportunity when that opportunity presents itself. And unfortunately, we have no clue when that opportunity is in fact going to present itself. So we've actually spent quite a lot of time talking about Pele's childhood. And I think to put that into context, remember that he was a bit of a child prodigy. He was one of the youngest players to play for Brazil and to win a World Cup and to score in a World Cup final or in the World Cup finals rather. So it makes sense that we've dwelt here because a large chunk of his sporting career happened so young. And here he remembers the air of disappointment as Brazil losing a World Cup final to Uruguay. And this is remember is when he's a boy. World Cups are so important for Brazil and no one thought we would lose, and especially not in such humiliating circumstances to Uruguay, who together with Argentina are our arch rivals. People couldn't bear the disappointment. Baru felt like a ghost town. It was also the first time I saw my father cry. Many of my father's friends couldn't stop themselves either. It was shocking to me, since I'd been brought up thinking that men didn't show their emotions like that. One day, I'll win you the World Cup, I promised my dad, to try and make him feel better. A few days later, when he'd recovered, he told me that some people in the Maracan art had actually died from shock. Later on that day of the final, I went to my father's room, where there was a picture of Jesus on the wall, and I started wailing. Why has this happened? 
Why has this happened to us? We had the better team. How come we lost? Why, Jesus? Why are we being punished? You know, if I'd been there, I wouldn't have let Brazil lose the cup. If I'd been there, Brazil would have won. Or if my dad had been playing, Brazil would have got that goal we needed. There was no answer. I was a boy who loved football, and the defeat affected me deeply. Duncan, this might be the first sowing of the seeds of what he wanted to go on and achieve, maybe maybe even subconsciously not knowing at the time. But the spark of motivation can be a really powerful one. I mentioned it earlier, Greg, that I think certain performance domains can take on an almost spiritual symbolism for people in certain cultures, especially arts and sport. They, they just move people emotionally. And I think to such degrees, I mean, Apparently, some people died from shock. I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if that was a true story or not. But they move people so emotionally. That's obviously why we love them and we love watching them. We love participating in them. And I think it's incredibly difficult to live in those cultures and to be a, around like a large group of people, especially your peers and your family, who feel so passionately. And for you not to be moved by it, I think that'd be almost impossible. So you get indoctrinated in. Yes, I think he's internalized that motivation and we're hearing kind of imagery here that if i was there i would have scored that goal if i was there brazil wouldn't have lost and i really do feel like there's a spiritual element connected with kind of imagery it's really powerful and it's incredibly interesting to me and in a performer's podcast tale as old as time another important figure appears in pele's life the coach of Pequeno, valdemar de brito a brazilian world cup player known as i think he might have stole your nickname here duncan the dancer Oh, that is my name. <laughs> I think God had his eye on me when he sent Valdemar de Brito to play an important part at that stage in my career. It did seem quite unbelievable that a player of his caliber would come to teach kids. In the middle of nowhere, too. Yet he was sincere and committed to the job. He just wanted to teach youngsters. Valdemar spoke to us like adults and expected us to afford him similar respect. We did. He demanded discipline and he got it. He taught us a lot. We trained hard and he introduced lots of new techniques, including movement off the ball and how to read the game. Some of us took it in, some of us didn't. I always paid lots of attention. Burkino were a strong team and under Valdemar, we became even stronger. We were invincible. For me, Greg, it's really important who and how that message is delivered. It's just so important. He's looking up like this guy has played for Brazil. I'm not going to try and pronounce his name. I'm not Portuguese like you. The impact of meeting someone who's been there and done it, again, a tale as old as time. The next sentence, we've got three themes. With me playing striker, we won the championship, scoring 148 goals in 33 games. He say says, that again. Say that again. Say it again. With me playing striker, we won the championship, scoring 148 goals in 33 <laughs> games. And soon, obviously, opportunities came knocking on his door. He ended up, much to his mother's protestations, going to Santos in Rio. It's a much bigger city than Bauru. And the president of the club even stated that he would be taken care of personally because his mother didn't want him to go. And so he has a kind of almost movie scene, teary goodbye on the train, you know, leaning out the window with his parents and he heads to Santos to play professional football. He says the first lessons Valdemar de Brito taught me on the road to Santos were excellent ones. He told me to play as if I was still in Bauru, just having a kick around. He told me not to be awed by the stars playing for Santos. It's normal to feel a bit inhibited to begin with, he reassured me, but the people there are great and will help you. I think the comment that jumps out to me or the advice is, you know, play like you're having a kick around. And that's really about focusing on the game itself. And now you've stepped up a level, not getting caught up in the external pressures, which is obviously great advice. I think we're talking really about focus here. And for me, one of the best definitions of focus that I've heard is, the focus is the absence of irrelevant thoughts. So you're just purely involved in what's most important. And I think when we discussed Chrissy Wellington in episode nine, one of her maxims was just race. And that was it. Like that was her plan. That was what she was going to focus on was just race. And here it's just play. And I think you reflected on, you said how many years and years and years you've been working with athletes and that notion of just getting a to play, to focus on the task. And that's what, that, that's the advice here. It sounds incredibly simple, but it's very difficult to execute. And there is definitely a beauty in that simplicity. He goes on to say that what Valdemar also taught me about the press, as in the written press, newspapers. Look here, he said forcefully, something else very important that you will do. You will not read the papers and you will not listen to the radio. 
And throughout my career, and even afterwards, I hardly ever paid attention to the press. Of course, if I was told there was a nice piece about me, then I'd read it. That was okay. But as a rule, I tried not to be bothered about what people said about me. Valdemar's words made me feel that he had absolute faith in me and that he wouldn't be staking his name on a boy like me if he didn't. Our conversation really assured me. And his last words were, no smoking, no drinking, no women, and no hanging around with a bad crowd. Pretty sage advice. There is that saying, common sense is not common practice. Well, he's, he's now on the path to high performance. And it sounds simplistic, but how many people get caught up with the smoking, the drinking, the women hanging out with their own crowd? We definitely saw that in episode seven with Mike Tyson. And I think, yes, it's, it's simple advice, common sense, but again, not necessarily common practice with those on the path to high performance. So again, no one does it alone. He's coming into a new team here and he's obviously a young player coming into Santos. Great team. And he had lots of confidence in his ability as a player, even though he was still so young, but he didn't have a ton away from the game. Off the pitch, I was a little shy. I was a skinny little thing, less than 60 kilos. On the pitch, however, I became someone else. I was fearless. I had already played with grown-ups in Baru, and I wasn't intimidated by who these players were. Formiga was asked to mark me, and yet I was able to dribble past him twice. I think that's what impressed Lula, the manager, so much. If it was a test, I definitely passed it. I like the way you were playing. You're going to have to build up your body, though, if you're going to play in the main team. I was going to have to spend some time in the junior levels. If you're going to play an elite level, you have to take care of all levels of performance, whether it's physical, technical, tactical, and mental. It sounds like technically he's developed a really strong skill set. He seems to have a good head on his shoulders, but physically he needs to build his body up. Now, he has certain attributes, but the reality is if you're going to play with men week in, week out, you have to address that area. And obviously, I'm sure he does. So he actually spends some time in the youth teams, what he refers to as the junior level. And he says, even though I was allowed to carry on training with the pros, I still had to play with the under 20s and the under 18s. And I also trained alone for hours at a time. I knew I really had to apply myself if I was going to get anywhere. For me, I was playing not just for the crowds, but in an attempt to achieve my own ambitions. There was no way I could fail. I took Lula's advice to heart. I began to eat like a horse taking full advantage of the excellent food on offer at the club at all hours, in the hope that I would fatten up fast. I couldn't grow up quickly enough. So Duncan, when we're talking about athletes that are, that are growing, we're talking about athletes that are developing. And it sounds like him spending some time with the youth teams, with those under 20s, those under 18, shows that the club had a real understanding of what is developmentally appropriate for him at that time. But the big question, Dunk, he has another grenade for you. How do you blend performance and development? Greg, I mean, to be honest, I think we're still getting to grips with that question now. And we've been wrestling with it, it seems like, since the 1950s. People often present it uh, dichotomously, that it's it's performance and development. And, but I actually don't think they're mutually exclusive. I think if we, if we switch the word performance for results or outcome, then we might see a little more daylight between the two. I believe early in the developmental journey, the focus should really be around developing the necessary skills to be successful thinking about you know what skills do we need to acquire the basic understandings of the game itself you know mental growth we need to think about physical conditioning and and all that's got to be tailored to the athlete's current stage yet it doesn't necessarily mean that has to come at the cost of results and outcomes but rather how much weight do we attach or value to each of those obviously when we're talking about the professional level results are going to be highly valued but that doesn't mean development should also not be a part of a focus at the elite level. So blending development focus and performance requires that, that nuanced approach. But we don't need to see them as two opposing factors, but rather complementary. And how do we connect both of them in a unified strategy that's best for the athlete themselves? So Duncan, that all, that all sounds great in theory, but obviously um, practicality is probably a little bit more important here. How do you do it? It's all well and good saying we need to balance and get the weights of development and performance correct. How can we go about that? Another great question. One of the ways that we can do it is develop goals that incorporate both the developmental milestones and also performance outcomes. For example, if we think about tennis, we might want to develop the technical skill of a topspin forehand. And the performance outcome might be how many forehand winners do we hit in matches based on the development of that skill. It's an integration of both 
developmental milestones and performance outcomes. Another thing that we can do is use performance data and view performance results as diagnostic tools rather than actually like final judgments. Mm -hmm. So analyze games and competition outcomes, identify strengths that can be leveraged, and then also think about the weaknesses that need to be improved. So when we think about when we use data as a diagnostic tool, as opposed to this is a judgment and we take this personally, we can combine the developmental area and the outcome. And then probably lastly would be periodization and planning. How do we implement a periodization strategy in training that, you know, at different stages of the season, we're going to focus on different elements. So there might be phases that are more heavily weighted towards developing skills or physical attributes. So for example, in soccer, we're going to have a, you know, a heavy preseason that's going to focus on physical development. Whereas when we shift towards postseason tournament time, then obviously the outcome is going to be a little more focused around results. I think it's important to maintain a long-term vision that incorporates both development and performance. And we need to be able to communicate that to the athlete themselves and to all the stakeholders that are involved in their journey. I think there's absolute gold in there. And to be honest, if you're listening and you're a coach, coaching at any level, any sport, any discipline within that sport, Go back and listen to the last couple of minutes. There were some really great practical strategies in there that Duncan's just given, and those are all tools that can be rolled out and that are going to have a positive impact on you as a coach and ultimately on your athletes that you're looking to develop and balance performance with. So I, I want to applaud you, Dunk, for including so much, so much rich information in such a short period of time. Let's get back to Pele. No matter how good you are, you're going to be making mistakes and you're going to experience failure on the path. So playing in a youth game, after missing a penalty, he tries to make a dawn departure. The following morning, I woke up at 6.30 in the morning, fully intending to run back home to Baru. I quietly packed my suitcase, tiptoed out my room, and headed to the door. As I got there, I heard a voice. Hey, you. Who gave you permission to leave? It was Sabuzinho, the club's general dog's body. Club rules. All minors need to have written authorization to leave the building. I said, I've got it. Just let me go and I'll bring it to you later. No, you won't. You'll bring it to me right now or you aren't going anywhere. And that was that. My plan to leave failed at the first hurdle. Now I realize that it was for my good fortune that he stopped me going, even if it was for a typically Brazilian administrative reason. When he realized what I was trying to do, Sabozinho taught me an important moral lesson. Everyone makes mistakes once in a while, he said. The trick is to learn from them, not give in to them. Duncan, mistakes happen. Have you got any top tips for listeners to learn from their failures? My, my first question often to performers when they've you know suffered a bit of a setback is, did you pick something so easy to do that you never expected to fail? That's a great question because it kind of hits them a little bit in the gut. You know, I'll say again, did you pick something so easy to do that you never expected to fail? The usual answer, you know, they kind of puff out their chest is, oh, no, no, no. But again, failure or challenges and setbacks we've talked over and over that that is part of this journey as i said just previously failures are not final judgments on you or who you are as a person while rather we got to see failures or, or setbacks as i like to think of it as time stamps on that road to success for me there's a few practical things that i found that work with athletes when we think about failure and, and how we may move past them relatively quickly. The first one, we've talked about identity a lot. And I, and I think detaching failure from identity, separate your own self-worth from your failure, because failure can often feel very personal. So instead of saying something like, I am a failure, say something like, I experienced a failure. Number two would be analyze what happened, but don't ruminate on it. I think there's a really fine line between productive analysis and then unproductive rumination. You know, break down the failure, understand what went wrong, why it went wrong, how are you going to get better, but dwelling on it, that usually leads to kind of inaction, self-doubt, you know, can decrease our confidence. Number three, I love the idea of embracing the power of yet. For instance, I haven't mastered this skill becomes I haven't mastered this skill yet. It just takes on a different connotation. And the last one with regards to kind of overcoming setbacks and challenges is really developing or cultivating curiosity. Approach failures with that curiosity rather than judgment. What can I learn from this? Try and be a bit of a detective. What did I do wrong? Can you open up a more constructive and less emotionally charged analysis by being curious? Performance for me often is like puzzle pieces. How do we fit different puzzle pieces together? And sometimes we're just missing a bit. And sometimes things just went a little bit wrong. So being curious 
rather than judgmental. So those are kind of four tips that might help the listeners kind of overcome setbacks and challenges. Those are four phenomenal tips, way better than my random ramblings, tangents, analogies you've given for <laughs> super, super practical, tangible, useful. And to be perfectly honest, I think, you know, I'm going to encourage people to, to mash that rewind button again and go back and listen through that. Um, we might wear the rewind button out a little bit today, but um, I think there's some absolute gold in there, some really concrete strategies um, for anyone who's listening. Well, I don't mean to toot my own horn, but beep, beep. <laughs> <laughs> Ah, bravo, bravo. Ah, let's get back to Pelle, though. Here we go. Get away from you for, for five minutes and, and listen to what he's got to say. In my first full season at Santos, I made the number 10 shirt my own. I was the highest scorer in the Sao Paulo State Championship, which was the main league in which we played, with 17 goals. My training and eating was also changing my body. After six months, I'd put on more muscle. I was stronger. Actually, my legs put on so much bulk that each of my thighs had the same circumference as my waist. It amazed me how my body was looking different. I trained hard. I've always been a perfectionist, and I still am. I worked mostly on my left foot since it wasn't as powerful as my right foot. I also practiced headers. Back in those days, there was a contraption that had a ball hanging from it that you would just jump up and practice heading. Santos also had a gym, and for a year, I learned karate, which was also very useful in learning how to fall and how to jump. I learned judo after that. They really helped in increasing balance and agility, when I dribbled past players, I hardly ever fell. Duncan, here we see a player working on developing what can only be described as a well-rounded athletic ability, you know, a little bit of cross-training. But he also discusses working on strengths and improving his weaknesses. If we reflect back on episode eight, Kobe Bryant, the Mamba mentality, we heard from Kobe early on that he identified one of his weaknesses was his play with his left hand. And and he took it upon himself that he was going to do everything he could with his left hand, including he was going to brush his teeth with his left hand. Kobe, actually, there's a famous story that he got into tap dancing lessons because he wanted to strengthen his ankle. So, he, you know, thinking outside the box. For me, this is all about getting your head up, looking outside of your own immediate performance domain and seeing what you can learn from other people. I think often we look within our own performance domain, you're likely going to be replicating what your opponents are doing, to be honest. And, and therefore that creates echo chambers. You just, you, you know, you're just regurgitating doing the same things. Exploring different fields can really lead to that notion or the term that I've heard in high performance sport of cross pollination of ideas where concepts and techniques from one domain can be applied in novel ways, can be applied to other domains. When you kind of go outside of your performance domain and look at other areas of, for improvement, like tap dancing or, you know, can't think of another off the top of my head, but. Um, this can result in some, you know, really innovative solutions that are not bound by what we'd say is like the conventional wisdom of that sport. Well, we did say that your nickname was the dancer, so I, I'm, I'm not surprised that you can't get your head out of the tap world for sure. So in the spirit of uh, concrete examples that you've been absolutely knocking out the park today, have you got any examples of cross-pollination and, and finding innovative solutions in, in sports? Yes, and I think some of the best ideas I've heard from have come from Formula One and and how Formula One has really been at the cutting edge of innovation. And when we think about Formula One, the margins of performance and success are so slim that it creates a forcing function for teams to innovate and, and look outside of you know just what happens in Formula One. There's a, there's a couple of examples. It's well known that the aerodynamics of Formula One, some of the cars have been heavily influenced by the aviation industry. A couple of other things that I've heard that F1 have really pioneered the use of you know really advanced materials from other industries, carbon fiber composites, that's all about making the car lighter and stronger and also about you know keeping the car on the track. F1 has also worked with medical science to improve driver safety, studying the effects of G-forces on the human body. The head and neck support that was a relatively recent addition to F1 cars, it's all about safety. And those insights came from trauma medicine and biomechanics. The last couple that F1 has really been ahead of the game is the application of technology. So they've looked at things like thermal imaging cameras have been used by teams to monitor things like uh, tire and brake temperatures. And these were initially developed in military applications. But again, that cross-pollination of ideas is just extraordinary. And the last one that we've seen in the Drive to Survive series, if anyone hasn't watched that, like that's a must-see on Netflix, their use of digital technology and augmented reality or AR has really been embraced by F1, whereby... You know, they're kind of using gaming and military training, um, F1 simulators, as it were, to 
you know, test aerodynamics, but also to prep the race car drivers for certain tracks. So there's a lot there, but I think F1 has probably done this better than anyone. And it might be that forcing function because the the margins of victory are literally by the millisecond. Ton there. And to be honest, Mercedes, if you are looking to get rid of Toto Wolf, there's um I'm sure Duncan's gonna throw his uh his hat in the ring for the <laughs> for this for the team principal job with that insider knowledge. Really great concrete examples again. So 1958 rolls around and there's increased excitement in club games as people are trying to do that little bit extra to impress national team selectors for the upcoming World Cup that we know is going to be held in Sweden. Now he manages to do so and his dad was actually the first to hear that he was selected with the chairman of the club at Santos officially telling Pelé he was on the plane to Sweden. Now obviously going into that World Cup Brazil was naturally fancy to do well as they are in most World Cups even though Pelé is struggling with a knee injury and didn't play any of the warm-up games, casting doubt over his selection into the 11. And remember, 1958, there's no substitutes at this time. He says, we already knew we were a strong team and we'd had good preparation. As well as Fiol and Dr. Gosling, we had Paolo Amaral to help us, a pioneer in physical training. He worked us very hard. There was no let-up and no complaints were tolerated. My only criticism at the time, not that I expressed it to him, of course, was that he made everyone do the same exercises, regardless of their condition, age, or body type. As well as being injured, I was only 17, remember? So I felt the effects of this regime. But in those days, the mere presence of a trainer with any sort of strategy was progress. And in truth, the intensity was good, especially for such a short campaign as the World Cup, with only a maximum of six games to play. Duncan, the Brazilians were really on the cutting edge of training here, and physical preparation was vital. Yeah, you're right. I mean, it's it's not individualized, which we probably wouldn't expect at that time. But that maxim of feel good, play good, that's been around for probably as long as time. And there's a reason for that. There's probably a strong element to truth to it. It, it highlights that interconnectedness between our psychological well-being and physical performance. Taking care of our physical body obviously enhances our psychological and mental well-being. Speaking of the psychological side of things, the Brazilians were also so forward thinking that they had the foresight to include psychology and had a psychologist on staff. As part of our preparations, the team psychologist, Dr. Joao Carvajales, had conducted tests on all of the players. We had to draw sketches of people and answer questions, which would help Dr. Joao make assessments about whether we should be picked or not. It was either ahead of its time for football or just odd, <laughs> or maybe both. About me, he concluded that I should not be selected. Pele is obviously infantile. He lacks the necessary fighting spirit. He also advised against Garincha. It was not seen as responsible enough. Fortunately for me and for Garincha, Fiola was always guided by his instincts rather than experts. And he just nodded gravely at the psychologist saying, you may be right. The thing is, you don't know anything about football. If Pele's knee is ready, he plays. Duncan, this isn't the greatest advertisement for psychology in a sports setting we'll ever see. What are your thoughts about how the field has developed since 1958? or just having the, the importance of having someone that understands the sport in this type of role? Picking soccer players based on their artistic abilities, I'm not sure that's the way to go. Big kudos to the coach. We just talked about thinking outside the box and seeking insights on the psychological side of players. That, again, is that cross-pollination of ideas and interdisciplinary thinking. I mean, way ahead of its time when talking 1958 here. And the second bit is... The coach is also having enough trust in himself to ignore the advice of the expert when it disagreed with his own evaluation and instinct. I think another example I've seen a lot of is the increase in the amount of sports science and data into sport at all levels. And for me, the true value of data collection, Greg, lies not really just in the accumulation of vast amounts of data. It's really about the insights and actionable strategies that we can derive from an analyzing the data. It's really about being about data informed, not data driven. And I think coaching nowadays is probably more a combination of art and science than ever before. I think it's really important to have a good handle on each. It's important to recognize that any singular person is unlikely to have the necessary expertise to evaluate performance effectively. So we've seen this growth of interdisciplinary teams of people working together to provide insights to coaches. And ultimately, the coach is the decision maker, and they get to make those final decisions on things like selection. I don't think individual staff that are not the head coaches, like a psychologist here, should be making a determination on 
who plays and who doesn't. Now, if we were to make decisions based on artistic ability, I think my friend Mark Whitley, phenomenal goalkeeper, would be making this Brazil side. I just want to give Mark a shout out. Mark does all of our thumbnails for our episodes and, and spends his time graciously churning out stuff for me and dunking the knockback from time to time for him to come out and produce just outstanding art. So we want to take a moment to appreciate Mark and all the hard work that he puts in as well. And I think to add to that, Greg, if you haven't checked us out on TikTok, we're on TikTok. Believe it or not, I don't know who would want to watch this on TikTok, but we're on there. And Mark's thumbnails been gangbusters for us. So get there while you can before the US government shuts us down. So going into the, the tournament, obviously at 17 year old, he is the youngest player at the tournament and he has been selected um, despite his, uh, his slight knee injury for the first game versus the USSR. And he knows his knee isn't quite right. After that, the game settled down and I started to feel my knee more and more, although I tried hard to hide it. I was playing quite well, but felt anxious wanting to preserve our lead and for the game to end now. Always a mistake, often fatal. I missed two attempts at goal that I would surely have buried had I been more relaxed. The Russians came at us strongly in the second half, but our defence was impregnable. And then finally the tension was lifted when we caught them flat at the back as they pushed forward and Vava again beat Yashin. That night after our celebration dinner, I went back to my room and replayed in my mind every move, every kick. I wasn't too pleased with my performance. I could have played better. I tried to chip Yashin at one point and realized that was just pure cheek on my part. In those days, he was considered one of the best goalkeepers in the world. And that is quite cheeky trying to chip Lev Yashin. Duncan, it sounds like he's taking a little bit of time to, to reflect and, and analyze his performance here a little bit. And we talk about reflecting a lot with people and I think people throw that word around a lot. Is there any sort of structure or a, a best practice, a good way that we can go about actually reflecting? Yeah, absolutely. We're hearing here, there's quite a bit of imagery going on as part of that reflection process. I think if you just sit down and think about what's happened, it's going to have limited impact. You really have to structure your reflection and use guiding questions. What went well and why? What didn't go so well? What could be better? How was I feeling during performance? What could I have done differently? You know, be very structured in the questions and write down your answers. Because I think when you write things down, it adds clarity and helps organize your thoughts. Ultimately, in reflection, we have to balance objectivity with subjectivity. You know, when we analyze our performance, it's crucial that we have some objectivity. We've got to acknowledge that performances are very emotional. We have emotional responses to events that are, are really important. So we've got to balance these days, probably balance some of the data and the, and the statistics and the numbers that we might get from sports science, as I mentioned but also balance that with some subjectivity. How did you feel? We can balance that with also seeking external feedback. So sometimes our own reflections are, are ultimately going to be biased and limited and, and our emotions play a role there. So getting feedback from a coach or a peer or a mentor can provide that external perspective that will help that self-analysis. Feedback's really important to identify, you know, our blind spots in the reflection process. And then last but not least, the goal of reflection is not just about understanding past performance, it's also to inform our future actions. We want to make improvements. So after reflecting, identify specific actionable steps that you can take to improve. I absolutely love that you said there, the goal of reflection is not just to understand past performance, but to inform your future actions. I think when we, you know, when we think about reflection, the biggest reflection we see is the one when we look in the mirror. So if you wake up in the morning and you look in the mirror to see how your hair is, you don't just say, oh, my hair's a mess. You use that reflection to fix your hair. And I think that's a hugely important part. There has to be a product of reflection rather than just the process itself. Your hair's looking great tonight, Greg. Thank you very much. Took me several hours to get it into this state. So, of course, Brazil continued to perform well throughout the tournament. And naturally, they progressed to the final against who other than the hosts, Sweden. There were 49,000 people inside the stadium that day. Most of them supporting the home country, of course. But they were fair and applauded play on both sides. Now, despite Brazil conceding first, they held the lead at halftime. In the second half, we showed our true class, sweeping Sweden aside. I made it 3-1 11 minutes into the second half after shouting to Nilton Santos to cross a long centre to me. As it came in, I caught it first on my chest and let it drop as the defender Gustafsson came at me. Flipping the ball over his head, I ran around him and volleyed home the shot. Though I say so myself, it was a nice goal. And a goal in a World Cup final. It's one of my all-time favourite goals because I was so young. But also because no one had seen a goal like that before. He goes on to say the final play was a high cross. I outjumped two Swedish defenders, touched the ball with my head, and, as if in slow motion, 
watched it loop into the corner of the net. Brazil's fifth goal and my second of the match. The game was assured. We were going to be world champions. Then, all of a sudden, I passed out in front of the goal. Garincha came over and picked up my legs to circulate the blood to my head. When I came to, the game was already over. I was overcome with emotion. My first thoughts were about my family in Baru. Did they know that we were champions? I wanted to speak to my parents, but there were no telephones. And so I kept on saying, I've got to tell my dad. I've got to tell my dad. At last, after the bitter disappointment of 1950 and 1954, we were world champions for the first time. It was an indescribable feeling and one I wanted to experience again and again. So Duncan, we mentioned this earlier, but this is the moment where Pele not only atones for the feelings of previous tournaments, but becomes the world famous player that we all know. This is him launching himself onto the world stage. Yeah, I think it's really interesting because we heard from him earlier how impacted he was by the Brazil teams in the past that weren't successful. And it's interesting that he's internalized and taken that burden on himself with Dan Carter in episode four, I believe it was, that Dan was actually very careful not to take on the failures of previous All Black teams. He didn't want to internalize that pressure. But Pele's like, I'm going to take it on myself. But he is overcome by emotion. It probably has weighed on him a little bit. It's just two performers absolutely at the top of their sport, just very different mental approaches to how you're going to approach pressure and the burden of a whole nation on your back. Uh, The 1958 World Cup was my launching pad. I was on the front pages of newspapers and magazines all over the world. Paris Match ran a cover story immediately after the victory, saying that there was a new king on the block. The name stuck, and very soon I started to be called King Pelé, or more simply, the king. My friends used to tell me that I was a real king because I'd been chosen by the people. The return trip to Brazil after the heights of Stockholm couldn't pass quickly enough. The whole team was emotionally drained as well as physically exhausted and we all just wanted to get home as soon as possible. Everywhere they went, the team was just mobbed. There was huge crowds, huge receptions. And to be honest, they just wanted to get out of there. They were a bit drained from things. He says, finally, he made it home. There waiting for us were all our families. My father, Dondinho, choked with emotion and other relatives. My mother, Celeste, who kissed me with tears in her eyes and tried unsuccessfully to remain strong, as she said, with a lump in her throat, congratulations. She didn't say as much, but it was clear that my mother had finally understood that this game could be a power for good in our family. And perhaps my father was seeing some of the disappointment in his own frustrated career swept away by my success. I could tell he was proud of his son, and that meant so much to me. Duncan, football is more than a game. I don't care what you think about it in terms of whether you want to love, hate it, sit down, watch it, spend no time doing it. It is more than a game, and it means so much to so many people. You know, we've talked about that weight of expectation. Does understanding that it means so much to to so many people, does it help or hurt performers? Another great question. As you just alluded to, I think in certain countries with certain sports, we're talking football in Brazil. You might think hockey in Canada, rugby in New Zealand, you know, cricket in India. It's just an integral part of the national identity and the culture. And for me, to answer your question, I think that can both be empowering and also have you know, some challenging effects on performance. How does it help performance? I mean, there's immense motivation and pride for representing your country. When you get to pull on, you know, that all black jersey or you get to pull on the Brazilian shirt to step onto the field of the Maracanã or the Canadian hockey jersey. I don't know. I've n- I've obviously never done it, but I imagine just that immense emotion and pride. So I think that's got to be a strong motivating factor. I think there's a shared cultural significance that can foster that unity and, and cohesion among team members. I think we're all in it together because we're, we're playing for a country, something that's bigger than ourselves. In countries where sport is that cultural cornerstone, players also you know, enjoy you know, a good support system. If that is the national sport, the country's probably going to throw a lot of resources behind it. Even in a poorer country like Brazil, they're going to throw some resources behind the soccer team. And how might it hurt you as a performer? There's obviously immense pressure and expectations, and that can create a fear of letting people down, your fans, your family. 
an entire country, I, I think that can be quite overwhelming. And obviously when it's overwhelming, it can lead to anxiety and stress and burnout. In these kind of countries that I've mentioned, the, the amount of public scrutiny and criticism that comes along is probably unbearable for some people. Athletes just live under that intense scrutiny and their performances are, and, and even their personal lives are, are subject to you know public opinion. So yes, it can help performance, but unless managed correctly, it can be a burden. I reflect on our own English national soccer team. I think we can safely say pulling on the English national jersey has been a burden since 1966 for many of our teams and many of our players. We haven't managed to overcome that. Hopefully in the next few years, we'll we'll see a change. But I think that rings true for me with England especially. This is an interesting one because during this time, he has to go and serve in the military and it's mandatory and he tries to get out of it since he does what he's already called and i quote here national service by bringing home a world cup win but apparently he could only get out of military service if, if you had a physical impairment which is a really really hard one to spin for your national team center forward to say that you've got a physical impairment and you get away from from national service so he comes out of the army and it's it's back to business as usual and for pelle naturally that business is goals and he's scoring them all around the world on tours and he's scoring them for absolute fun. He becomes more and more well known. And again, speaking of business, we won't go into much detail here, but as he began to make some money, he started to make some investments in some enterprises that didn't quite work with him losing a lot of money by trusting the wrong people. It almost feels like that's a tale as old as time when it comes to, comes to sport performance. While playing so many games for his club, he went in in the 1962 World Cup with a groin injury. Sounds like a recurring theme here, going into major tournaments with injuries. Um, but he kept it to himself, which he did previously, um, going into the first game. But during the first game, his groin finally gave way, and he would actually play no further part in the tournament that the team actually would go on to win. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> But during this process, again, he's learned a valuable lesson. The experience in Chile allowed me to reflect on my life. My family, my friends, and teammates from Santos would be important in helping me in my recovery. Footballers returning from World Cups nowadays return homes to lives of privilege and luxury that were unthinkable to us back then. It's funny to think that, going back to Santos after Chile in 1962, I was still living at Donna Georgina's place with Zocca and a bunch of teammates. On a day-to-day -day level, life was pretty much as it's always been. Duncan, again, I think we're starting to see more of his value shine through here. If we take a step to connect values with identity, what, what do values do, Greg? They, they give us that moral compass for our actions and it helps the consistency of our actions and ultimately align social relationships because people know who we are and, and also what you want and expect of other people. So when we talk about values, in essence, values are absolutely fundamental in that construction of an identity. They influence not only who we are as individuals and how we view ourselves, but also how we navigate our lives and also how we interact with other people and contribute to community. So we, we hear here from Pele that, you know, he's going back home and he's just, you know, assimilating straight back into life hasn't changed that much fundamentally and his values and who he is and how he's going to act and interact with other people has not changed because I think his values are really deeply connected to his identity and you know nothing's changed Think, things haven't really changed in his outside life but being known as a great player starting to come at a cost on the field because on the pitch however there was a change in how I was regarded instead of the young upstart and intriguing novelty as a world champion for club and country I was now the man to beat many coaches told their players to play forcefully against us and the art of football was certainly harmed by this as well as the physical challenge there was the psychological one too Players always try to wind each other up to get a reaction or to put you off your game. Yet, I was no shrinking violet. Okay, Duncan, being able to stay in the present moment despite, shall we say, a verbal barrage coming at him, that's a bit, that's a bit of a skill too. You know what, Greg? I'm going to throw it back on you. You've played soccer, football at a lot higher level than I ever have. How were you able to block out or how were you able to focus on the things necessary when you might have got a little chippy with opponents? Yeah, it's a funny one. I was never very good at blocking those things out, but I think what I probably was better at was redirecting my focus back to what it needed to be on. And I had a couple of really simple focus cues, actually. Um, Usually things would get chippy when you weren't playing particularly well. And my focus cue or the, the kind of the mechanism that I used to try and get myself back into the frame of mind that I wanted to be in was the phrase, pull your socks up. So that's a bit of a, sort of an English idiom, as it were, which means, you know, 
work a little bit harder, try a little bit harder, that sort of thing. But I'd actually pair it with the action of literally pulling my socks up. It doesn't matter if you get distracted. It's that ability to bring your focus back to what's important. I know yeah. earlier, you, earlier on you said that focus is that, I forget the exact phrasing, but it was something like focus is the lack of irrelevant thoughts that are going on. And I think for, for listeners, it's fine to have those irrelevant thoughts. The entire performance environment is full of irrelevant thoughts. But are you able to, once you've had an irrelevant thought, bring it back to something useful or helpful. And that was a mechanism that was that was pretty easy um, and, and useful for me as a player. Now, of course, as time passes, we move towards another World Cup year, this time in England in 1966. He says there's so many mistakes in the lead up to the 1966 World Cup. We could easily have not won any matches at all. All that coming and going, the training sessions, the matches, the change of climate and food, the lack of adequate preparation, the directors overconfidence, all this led to what happened in England. Total, shameful failure. For the Brazilians, not for the English, I would say. <laughs> I think that's important to know. It just sounds like there's some overconfidence and they've taken the eye off the proverbial ball, as it were. They probably got caught up with a lot of the external platitudes from everybody and that they went in as favourites and just did not prepare. And again, a lack of preparation ultimately is going to catch up with you. Playing against Eusebio and Portugal to stay in the competition, he says... We lost 3-1 and we were out of the cup. We played like novices, and all because we'd been badly prepared. We did as much as we were able to do. All the players faced that match with character and dedication. I hurt my knee in the first half, but there were still no substitutions allowed, so I had to stay on. And I received some pretty rough treatment even when the match was dead, especially at the hands, or rather the feet of, Morais, who kicked and sniped at me relentlessly. By the end of the match, I was limping and just there to make up the numbers. But the physical nature of the match doesn't explain our defeat. We just failed. I was annoyed by everything that happened in 1966. I let my disappointment show and said I wasn't going to play in another World Cup. From then on, I'd only play for Santos and occasionally friendlies with the national squad. Duncan, this is undoubtedly underperformance from any Brazil side, let alone the World Cup holders that have, has Pelé in the side. He mentions overconfidence there and, you know, a, perhaps a, a lack of preparation. How does overconfidence impact performance? Really great question. You know, I've, I've always taken it that I'd rather have an athlete that's overconfident than underconfident. I think it's easier to kind of temper confidence than it is to build it up sometimes. But overconfidence can impact performance. And, you know, some of the key ways that I see it happening, we mentioned it there, that word preparation. When you're overconfident, you probably don't put in enough effort and you don't prepare and it can lead to that complacency and we're not we're not doing the things necessary in training and we're, we're you know just believing that victory is gonna you know be assured overconfidence means we neglect details we overlook the importance of small things like you know technique or really thinking about the opponents and strategizing because we think we're going to win so we're not even going to focus on our opponents we we maybe you know let our diet slip or we don't recover the way that we should do. All things that are necessary. Overconfidence all, often leads to underestimating our opponents because we don't prepare for them. We don't think about their strategy. And therefore, when the game or the game starts to go against us, we can't adapt. And with that, what we often see is, you know, it's almost like a, a shock or a surprise or a panic sets in when a team that's overconfident all of a sudden falls behind and starts losing to a team they're expected to be they can really be caught off guard, leading to that panic and confusion. You often start seeing players pointing fingers at each other. We're going to see a team fall apart, probably a lack of cohesion. And ultimately, the last thing that we see with overconfidence is really you know, ignoring feedback because you think that everything's good. So all of a sudden being growth-minded and open-minded to feedback from coaches and from peers and from anyone else, all of a sudden that becomes very closed off. So overconfidence can impact performance in so many different ways. So Pele tries to leave behind the the failures of the, the 1966 World Cup um, and leaving behind the national team and starting to embrace his home life a little bit more with family, um, continues to play, obviously. Um, and if you doubt the reputation power and the respect that Pele commands, well, why don't you try this story on for size? In early 1969, we went over to Africa again. This was another extraordinary tour. We flew into Brazzaville in Congo, and I remember there were tanks and guns in the streets. While we were there, I remember the possibility arose of a quick hop to play a match in Nigeria. Yet, there was a worrying issue. Nigeria was involved in a civil war. 
Don't worry, said our business manager. They'll stop the war. It won't be a problem. I told him he was crazy. All I know is that we went to Nigeria, played a game in which we drew 2-2, and then flew out again. It's said that there really was a 48-hour ceasefire in the war made just for us, and my teammates remember seeing white flags and posters saying there would be peace just to see Pelé play. What about that one, Duncan? Wow, sport transcends, you know, the reality of life sometimes. That's all I've got. Sport's just bigger and more important than other things. Yeah, I don't know who's, who'd have the power to stop a, a civil war just to watch them kick a ball around a field at, at, at present. He says, in the late summer of autumn 69, all the attention started to focus on me reaching a thousand goals, a feat which had never been achieved before and still hasn't been equaled. It became the story of the year. With now only two goals to go until the magic number, newspapers moved into a hyped-up state of delirium. It was said that scoring a thousand goals would make me immortal. Nonsense, of course, but I did feel the pressure. The referee awarded us a penalty. The crowd erupted in euphoria and started chanting, Pele, Pele. But I wasn't the team's regular penalty taker. In normal circumstances, Carlos Alberto would have taken the kick. But this time, he refused. The pressure on me to take it was enormous. My teammates told me that if I didn't, the crowd would never let us get out of the stadium. So I caved in and put the ball on the spot. Whack. My 999th goal. One to go. Now he talks about the, they were trying to maybe orchestrate it so he could score the goal in Rio or in Sao Paulo. But he said, I just wanted to get it over with as soon as possible. I couldn't wait to score this damn goal. The following game was only three days later against Vasco at the Maracanã. And the stakes were raised once more. The biggest stadium in the world was full to bursting point. The date was November the 19th, which is Brazil's national flag day. Something had to give, and it did. I was tripped up as I made a run into the box and the referee awarded a penalty. This penalty, I was going to take. For the first time in my career, I felt nervous. I'd never felt a responsibility like this before. I was shaking. I was on my own now. My teammates left me alone and stood along the centre line of the pitch. I ran to the spot, seemingly in slow motion, struck the ball. Goal. I ran straight to the back of the net and picked the ball up and kissed it. The stadium was erupting with firecrackers and cheers. All of a sudden, I was surrounded by a huge crowd of journalists and reporters. They put their microphones in my face and I dedicated the goal to the children of Brazil. I said we needed to look after the little children. Then I cried. I was put on someone's shoulders and I held the ball up high. Play stopped for 20 minutes as I did a lap of the pitch. Another wild story, Duncan. It's, it's really interesting to hear from someone who's played in such important games since he was 15, won World Cup titles. Hell, he's had the nickname as the King, but he feels so much pressure to score one single goal, like the thousandth. He scored 999 other goals, but just this one. Where's that pressure coming from now? I mean, I think it's pretty obvious. It's all external here. It, it's all about the fans. It's all about the media. It's all about everybody else. And I think up until this point, Pele's barometer of success has really been internal and he's been focused kind of on his own goals. To play a thousand games as a professional is unbelievable. To score a thousand goals is another stratosphere. But he's taken on this pressure of an entire nation and perhaps an entire sport. Greg, honestly, there's a burden to excellence. Like He's so good. He, he literally is, you know, the greatest player of the century. Taking that on board history and setting record can weigh on anybody he, he's human i think also that it's a penalty as well which is just a pressure filled yeah. situation as well you know if it had been a cross that came through a defender's blasted it off his knee and he's gone in maybe he wouldn't feel that safe amount of pressure he says after the disappointment of 1966 i'd retired from the national team however when thoughts turned to the 1970 world cup in mexico i had a change of heart and after a two-year gap decided to play for my country again i decided that i was not going to end my career as a loser after everything I'd achieved, after the buzz of scoring a thousand goals, I was not going to take my leave from the international game under a cloud. I was going to go out on top. I may have competed in three World Cups already, but in none of them did I take part in every game in the tournament. I was desperate to play a complete tournament. That gave me a lot of focus. I had something to prove. There was also the important motivation of national pride. If we could win Brazil a third championship, then the Jules Rimet trophy would be ours for good. I remembered instantly my promise to my father back in 1950, then that terrible defeat against Uruguay in the Maracanã. I'd sworn that Brazil would not have lost there if I'd been there, 
and now I had my chance for some kind of revenge. Brazil had not played Uruguay in a World Cup since then, so this 1970 match would be particularly special to me and the rest of the team. The people who asked me about this match had no idea how important beating Uruguay was for me. I'd suffered as a nine-year-old boy, crying so much and promising that one day I'd avenge that Maracanã defeat. We were a better team than the Uruguayans, just as we had been in 1950. The difference now was that 20 years on, it was the better team that won. The side that would go on to be called the beautiful team, the best that ever played the game, was through to the World Cup final, the fourth time Brazil had reached the summit of one of the world's greatest tournaments. And of course, they went on to beat Italy in the final and win the trophy for the third time, getting to keep the old Jules Rimet trophy, and which was later replaced with the World Cup that we all now know and love, which I recently found out is actually solid gold, Duncan. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Fun fact. Eventually decided to retire from international football in front of, get this, 180,000 people at the American R. Um, big stadium, obviously packed out. The football was unmemorable, ending in a 2-2 draw but I can never forget the send-off I received from the loving crowd. I found it hard to concentrate on the game and only played the first 45 minutes. When the match was over, the entire stadium was chanting, stay, stay. I made a lap of the stadium surrounded by kids, the crowd still imploring me not to go. My shirt, that hallowed golden green, was in my hands, but I couldn't stem the flow of tears. Duncan, he seems to be leaving a lot behind here, and I know a lot of athletes really struggle with the, the process of transitioning and away from their sport when they retire. Is that what we're seeing here? Yeah, I think undoubtedly. He's been a professional since he was 15. He's now 34, so 19 years on. There's just a lot to unpack with athletic identity and that idea of transitioning out of sport. I think for the listeners, athletic identity is really that, that sense of self that is closely tied to your role as an athlete. And this is reinforced over years and years and decades of training for Pele, it's been reinforced over the last 19 years and wearing the gold and yellow jersey of Brazil and living in that lifestyle as an elite athlete. So when you retire, you lose that role and that can feel kind of like a loss of self. I think the other thing that comes along is the reality is it's public recognition for high profile athletes. All of a sudden, that public recognition is closely tied to your athletic achievements, but post retirement, there's probably less public attention because you're no longer performing that role and that can make you feel invisible and a diminished sense of importance and that can impact your self-esteem. The other thing that sport often gives us, and he's talked about the importance of teammates, is community and bonding. And, and you have that strong sense of community. You're part of a team. You're part of a club. You're part of, you know, you've got a, a big fan base. And when you leave that, you know, what is your community? So I, I think that can also make it feel like a sense of isolation. I guess a couple of things people can think about is when you transition out of a sport performance domain, how do you find a new challenge, a new purpose? Look for something else that will reinvigorate you, something that will give you fulfillment similar to whatever you have been doing. And then reevaluating your own self-worth. We are, we are people that compete in these performance domains. We are not just athletes. So I think you've got to reassess you're more than just your sporting achievements. And that can be difficult. That's not an easy thing to do. Athletes or performers, for most, know the end is coming. And obviously, it can happen abruptly if it's if it's injury or deselection. But if you know it's coming, so for example, Pele, he's, he's reaching, he's 34 years of age. He's been through a lot physically. You've got to prepare. You've got to start thinking about what does life look like afterwards. If we do those, then you know you might have a chance of a smoother transition with that uh with that retirement from football becomes the natural itch to get back into football um and you know that offer from new york cosmos was still on the table and after some deliberation and considering you know what would be the best for him and the best thing for his family to do he decides to go to new york and take that offer and as he says bring a little samba to the big apple um he said when i retired something inside me had died but playing football again would be like therapy. The Cosmos get a little bit better and they, they make the playoffs, but then lose to the Tampa Bay Rowdies. He says it's a disappointing end to a season of hard work, but at the same time, much progress had been made, both at the Cosmos and for the sport in America more generally. I really felt vindicated that I'd made the right decision to come out of retirement. I turned out twice for an American all-star team in May against Italy and England. And although we lost both games, it showed that the U.S. was starting to register on the international scene. And throughout the year, I'd been the focus of great interest as stories for newspapers, magazines, and on television. 
as well as continuing my work on the youth program. As well as things were going though, Duncan, like a lot of athletes, and you, you mentioned this, an awareness and knowing that he couldn't play on forever was creeping into his mind. He said, I'd been lucky in inheriting some good genes and in meeting someone who'd encouraged me to work hard to preserve and exploit the physical prowess they gave me. But I was also aware that it could not go on forever. Even so, I signed a one-year extension to my contract. I didn't know whether 1977 would prove to be my final season as a player. I just wanted to do the best for the club. He said the end was now in sight. I played 111 matches for Cosmos, scoring 65 goals. Our farewell tour saw us playing in Japan, in Venezuela, in Trinidad and Tobago, China and India. On my return, I knew I would have to face the emotional turmoil of my very last game, a match against my beloved Santos in which I would play one half for each side. In October 1977, three weeks before my 37th birthday, some 75,000 people gathered at the Giants Stadium to watch my farewell to the game that had given me so much joy over 21 years, packed with incident and excitement. Millions more watched on TV. I scored for Cosmos in the first half, but couldn't repeat the trick for my old Brazilian friends in the second, and Cosmos won 2-1. The end had come, and it was as charged with emotional intensity as my previous farewells for Brazil in 1971 and Santos in 1974. Again, the tears flowed down my face as I received the cheers of the crowd, but as this time as the rain came down, I didn't bother wiping them away. It was the end of my career for only the second club with whom I'd ever had a contract. I made a speech on the pitch and ended it by saying the words, love, love, love. Carlos Alberto tried to cheer me up, but I was really overcome. Players carried me around the pitch. My thoughts blurred between past and present. Once again, I thought of God, who'd given me the talent to play this beautiful game and who had protected me from serious injury. Wow, that is a, an emotional send off. I know there's a lot there, but I think that really highlights kind of the end of a career of, of as we mentioned, right from the onset of this episode, one of the, the real greats, and I don't think his achievements will really ever be surpassed. There may be quote unquote better players than him, but I don't think there's many people that are gonna achieve too much more. But before we wrap up this episode, Duncan, Pele considers the difference between his two personas. If you remember right at the top, I used his real name, Edson, and uh, he's obviously also well known as Pele. One of the ways I try to keep perspective on things is to remind myself that what these people are responding to isn't me, necessarily. It's this mythical figure that Pele has become. This is why I refer to Pele in the third person. I know some people don't like it, but for me, I have to raise up Edson in order to bring down Pele. It's not easy to separate Edson from Pele psychologically, try as I might, and of course the two are inextricably linked. I often find myself caught in this conflict between both personalities. I remember the dramatic occasion of my farewell game at Giant Stadium. For a moment I thought, that's it, I'm going home now, I'm just going to be Edson from now on. Big mistake. I knew in myself that I didn't want to play or need to play anymore, but Pele had taken on a life of his own. He overtook everything. Everybody in the football world wanted to keep him around. And so I carried on being Pelé. I'm proud Pelé is still here. After all, Pelé the footballer went to many places, scored many goals, won many trophies. What I did on the pitch was shown across the world in television, newspapers, magazines, every medium possible. I've been honoured in hundreds of different ways in different countries around the world. And the more you receive, the stronger the mythology becomes. Pelé cannot stop. He has commitments all over the world and he'll fulfill them. As Pele, I know I can make a difference. As I get older, however, I definitely like my life to be a bit more like Edson's and to make Edson and Pele better friends. As I approach my eighth decade, I have to find the balance that will make both Edson and Pele strong and happy. Edson is the simple things. Family, peace, calm, the countryside, fishing, riding, watching my kids grow up and enjoying my grandchildren. Pelé, well, you know him well now. I sense the dichotomy between Edson and Pelé every time I take out my credit card. On one side is the image of me doing a bicycle kick together with the signature of Pelé, and on the other is my real signature of Edson Arantes de Nascimento. It's a perfect representation of what I am. Both identities are separate and both are parts of me. They are two sides of what I am. And that's where we'll leave it. But before we go, success leaves clues. So what are your top 10 tips from 
the autobiography by Pele. Number one, embrace challenges with passion. Passion and enthusiasm are crucial in overcoming obstacles. By facing challenges with a positive attitude, individuals can turn potential setbacks into opportunities for growth and achievement. Throughout his career, Pele faced numerous challenges, from playing in poverty-stricken areas of Brazil to competing on the world stage against formidable opponents. Despite these hurdles, his love for the game and eagerness to overcome these obstacles defined his legendary career. Number two, trust in teamwork. Success is not the result of individual effort alone, but the product of collaboration and mutual support among team members. Pelé's success was rooted deeply in the harmonious synergy he shared with his teammates both on and off the field. His trust in their collective effort led to unprecedented success for Brazil and his club team. Number three, remain humble and grateful. Maintaining humility and gratitude regardless of one's achievements is essential for personal growth and enduring success. Despite achieving global fame and numerous accolades, Pele always credited his success to his mentors, teammates and family, never losing sight of his humble beginnings. Number four, adapt and overcome. The ability to adapt to changing circumstances and persist in the face of adversity is key to long-term success. When injuries threatened his participation in crucial matches, Pele adapted his playing style and preparation routines to overcome these challenges, illustrating resilience and determination. Number five, value discipline and hard work. Discipline and dedication are foundational to achieving excellence and sustaining peak performance. Pele's rigorous training regime and disciplined lifestyle off the field was instrumental to his success as his natural talent, demonstrating the importance of hard work and dedication. Here's one for you, Duncan. I've heard it said that talent without discipline is like an octopus on roller skates. There's plenty of movement, but you never know if it's going to be forwards, backwards, or sideways. <laughs> Number six, understand the weight of expectations. Navigating the pressures and expectations from oneself and others is crucial for mental well-being and performance. Despite the immense pressure of being a national icon, Pelé learned to manage expectations, focusing on his love for the game rather than fear of failure. Number seven, embracing identity beyond sport. Developing a sense of self that transcends professional achievements allows for a more fulfilling life. After retiring, Pelé pursued roles that highlighted his other passions and interests, showcasing a multifaceted identity beyond just being a football legend. Number eight, invest in your relationships. Cultivating meaningful relationships and connections is as important as achieving professional success. Pelé valued his relationships with family, friends, and teammates, crediting those connections as integral to his success and happiness. Number nine, give back and influence positively. Using one's platform and success to influence positive change and give back to the community is both a privilege and a responsibility. Beyond his football career, Pelé dedicated himself to various philanthropic efforts, impacting lives worldwide and advocating for children's rights and education. And finally, number 10, balance legacy with living. Finding a balance between building a legacy and living a fulfilling personal life is essential for happiness and satisfaction. Pele's pursuit of personal interest and family time, alongside maintaining his legacy as a football great, exemplifies the importance of balancing professional accolades with personal happiness. As usual, Greg, that's a fantastic top 10. As with all of our performers, there are undoubtedly things that we need to avoid in their story to maximize our own performance. So what are our top 10 things to avoid from Pele's story? Some definite pitfalls to avoid here. Number one, neglecting financial education. A lack of financial literacy and oversight can lead to significant losses, regardless of one's earnings from the career. Despite earning a substantial income, Pele experienced considerable financial losses due to poor investment and misplaced trust in his advisors, highlighting the need for financial education and personal involvement in financial decisions. Number two, ignoring early warning signs. Ignoring early signs of problems, whether it's in health, relationships, or business, can lead to more significant issues down the line. Pele's initial dismissal of his financial advisor's mismanagement hints resulted in a financial debacle, underscoring the importance of heeding early warnings. Number three, underestimating the impact of injuries. Playing through injuries without proper healing or understanding their long-term impact can jeopardize an athlete's career and health. Pele's decision to play through pain and injury during critical tournaments risked not only immediate performance, but also his long-term health and career longevity. Number four, overlooking life beyond sport. 
Focusing solely on one's athletic career without planning for life after retirement can lead to a challenging transition period. Although Pele eventually achieved fulfillment beyond football, his initial struggle with retirement highlights the necessity of preparing for life after sport. Number five, succumbing to external pressures. Allowing external expectations and pressures to dictate one's actions and decisions can lead to compromised integrity and personal dissatisfaction. Pele felt overwhelming pressure to score his 1,000th goal, a milestone more driven by public and media expectations than his own personal ambition, causing him undue stress. Number six, isolating from support networks. Neglecting relationships and support networks in pursuit of career success can result in isolation and missed opportunities for personal growth. The demands of Pele's career often kept him away from family and friends, underscoring the importance of maintaining strong personal connections despite professional obligations. Failing to advocate for one's interests. Not advocating for one's interests, rights and well-being in professional settings can lead to exploitation and missed opportunities. There were instances when Pelé did not fully assert his worth or negotiate terms that reflected his contributions, highlighting the need for self-advocacy. Number eight, ignoring personal development. Overemphasis on current skills without investing in personal development can limit growth and adaptability. While he was naturally gifted, Pelé also dedicated time to improving his skills and understanding of the game, illustrating the dangers of complacency in personal development. Number nine, disregarding the power of adaptability. Failure to adapt to new challenges, environments and stages of life can hinder progress and fulfillment. Pelé's initial reluctance to consider life beyond football limited his view of potential future endeavors, emphasizing the importance of adaptability. And finally, number 10, overlooking the importance of legacy planning. Focusing solely on present achievements without considering one's legacy can lead to missed opportunities for lasting impact. Only later in his career did Pelé begin to actively engage in activities that would shape his legacy beyond the football field, illustrating the importance of early consideration of one's lasting impact. And finally, can I apologize for any Portuguese or Brazilian Portuguese that have messed up during the course of this episode of Performers? I've certainly really enjoyed talking about someone from a sport that I know and love so well, someone that is widely regarded as the greatest to ever play and possibly the greatest that will ever play. Um, I've really enjoyed the conversation, Duncan. I hope you have too. And I hope that all of our listeners will join us on our next episode of Performers.